so good morning to you all yeah this season we are meditating more and more about the resurrection of jesus christ the resurrection of jesus is the key for entire christian faith and we have heard from the speaking of life also if jesus was not risen our preaching is in vain if jesus was not risen our religion of faith and what all these institutes and these all all things come for nothing so entire christianity is based on one single truth that is jesus has risen from the dead and the central message of the gospel also is that jesus has been risen again from the dead these days we hear so much about the gospel and a story from uh, genesis till revelation we hear a uh, lot of preachings we hear about when the early church they started preaching the gospel they just preached to only one single ten sentence that is jesus whom you have killed has risen from the dead that's all the gospel it was in the early church when that first during the first uh, uh, beginning days of christianity so uh, i don't mean we should not preach other uh, other things also we should preach but we can understand what is the fundamental and basic truth about christianity and christian faith which is jesus has been risen from the dead as part of meditating the resurrection of jesus christ i would like to uh, take a couple of steps backward and uh, look at old testament script uh, sorry look at older scriptures in the light of resurrection you know in luke we see that the uh, disciples who were going through emmaus jesus met them on their way and he opened the scriptures to them what scriptures did he open the old scriptures so the resurrection of jesus is the key incident from which they started to interpret everything in the old testament and as well as what jesus has said and what jesus have done as just on what jesus did so they interpreted everything what he said what he did in the light of resurrection so what we are going to do is we'll pick up one particular event and try to interpret it from the resurrection and let's see what we can learn from that so the title of my message today is the true son of god and how jesus proved himself to be the true son of god according to the confession of peter the scripture reading also we have we have seen okay and we'll come back to that later i'll go to my introduction first <laughs> okay emperor's worship is a common practice and that we can observe in all the cultures and in all the histories you take the history of any nation you will find some part of emperor's worship you can find and you can find in uh, middle east you can find in europe you can find it even in india i would like to give you a few examples in egypt the pharaohs were worshiped as gods and they regarded as divinely ordained to provide to protect and to lead them not only in this life but also in the life after death you know pharaohs are the people who used to spend uh, uh, so much of money on their funerals you know on their tombs you know why they would they spend so much and uh, make their burial so grand it is because the people were believing these pharaohs will lead them in, through the life after death that is the reason they wanted to have uh, they wanted to give them great burial and not just them they would give burial to their animals their servants if one pharaoh died at least 60 70 servants also will die along with him because people have to serve him after life also so such a grand uh, funerals used to take place that pets also were been mummified so that their bodies may remain so that they can lead them in the after life and they were worshiping them so deeply because they were ho their hope was on pharaoh that the pharaohs will lead them after life 
In imperial China, emperors were regarded as the sons of heaven. And these sons of heaven, they represent the heaven on earth. Kings were considered as the rulers of everything under the heaven. And they are the bearers of the ma ma uh, mandates of heaven. They represent kingdom of God on earth. It's in China. All the kings, they are divinely ordained. That's what they, were, they used to believe. And everything that king says, it has to happen because he is the representative, he is the one who speaks for heaven. And in other words, he is authorized by heaven, which means he is authorized by God. And his word is the word of God. So all humans have to obey his word. So that's what people were believing in China. And that was quite a, uh, quite a long time ago. Let me show you a recent uh, example. It's in Nepal. Till May 28, 2008, a, mon uh, a monarchy was in power. The monarchy which were in power are called Shahs. Shahs dynasty. All entire family of Shah were ki killed in 2008. Shah's dynasty was considered as the incarnation of Vishnu, a high god in uh, Nepal's dominant religion. He is considered, uh, considered as the incarnation of God. So, that is the reason people were very much devoted towards the king in Nepal and they were faithful to uh, submit to give their allegiance to the king. Not only this, how can we forget the World War II? In World War II, Japan was so, uh, so Japanese were so loyal to their emperor in the war, fought till the end, showing their faithfulness towards their king, believing that their king will protect them. You might have heard these stories. Japan was the last country to give, give up the World War II. And a major force, major uh, be, belief or major uh, uh, support for the war was the king of Japan. And people, they were obeying his commandments so faithfully and they, they, uh, they obeyed till the point of their death in World War II. So, in all cultures, we can see the emperor worship is there. And in some places, they are considered as provider, some, in the, some protector, in some, uh, they are considered as the children of God, and sometimes they, call, uh, they are considered as the children of heaven. In other words, simply, it means the same, son of God, sons of gods. And uh, they are considered that they are going to lead them and guide them in afterlife. They are the hope that people have. And all these cultures, they have made this uh, emperor as God is because there are two major forces in this world that dominate the world and can change the world in any way it wants. Those are religion and number two, politics. These are the two powers that shape the world. So they brought these two together. So once these two things have come together, people have no other choice psychologically or mentally to go, go to anywhere else. So once these two come together, they become a very strong alliance. And, uh, uh, and these two caused the most violence in, throughout the history. And that is the reason the system of the system has been developed. The system of government combines theocracy, where God rules, that is the kingdom of God, with an absolute monarchy. According to this, the king exercises the absolute authority, uniting religion and politics within himself. We all know what religion politics together have done, and we are seeing now and then, you know, in every country even today. So that's what emperor's worship is all about on this earth in the history. There is another emperor who claimed himself to be the son of God. And we are going to uh, study a little about him. His picture is already on the screen. I guess you might have already guessed whom I am talking about. Okay. So in the scripture reading today, we read from Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 20, where it starts with these words. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? 
So Matthew was so very particular about giving the details of the location because he wanted to, uh, he, he, he wants to take our attention to the real context of that particular incident and so and we, sh we may not miss it out. That is the reason he is giving many details and one among them was Jesus was in the region of Caesarea Philippi. He is not in the city of Caesarea Philippi but in the region of Caesarea Philippi. What can you find in the region of Caesarea Philippi is this. In Caesarea Philippi region, this is actually a city and this region has been uh, built by Herod in, in honor of Caesar Augustus. And he, uh, Herod the great son, Philip, he built a great temple for Caesar Augustus. You know, Caesar Augustus is the first Caesar in this world, first great emperor, emperor who almost conquered all the land of the known world. So he built a temple and there the Caesar was worshipped. And there is also another temple called Temple of, oh, sorry, temple of Pan. There is, a, there is another God also. So Jesus was going through these areas and started uh, speaking whatever he spoke in Matthew chapter 16. And see, let, let's share a little, few details about Caesar and Philippi. Then we will be able to relate to what Jesus was trying to communicate and what, what, what he was trying to say. Number one, it is a Greek, Greek populated city. And Augustus Caesar gave this city to Herod the Great. Uh, and Herod built it. Of course, this land was given by Caesar Augustus to Herod and Herod the Great built it. Who in turn built a marble temple uh, for Augustus. And the temple was built and dedicated to Caesar by Philip, the son of Herod. Here, Caesar was worshipped as son of God. This is Roman imperial religion. Now, I guess you will be able to connect to the dots. So, Jesus was taking his disciples by this place. And he asked, he, go, he, he was passing by the temple where Caesar, the son of God's temple is there. And he asked, who do people say that I am? Okay. And there is also a temple of Pan. As I said, Pan is this God. You may find him in many places. He is a, uh, you know, uh, he's a half human, half goat God. He is God of death. And he is also God of prosperity also. And he is God of death. So people, they get scared of him. Okay, and uh, the word panic, it came from this name, pan, the god pan, from which the English word panic, fear, it came. So, Jesus was taking the disciples this area and he was asking the question. And pan's worship was like this. At the bottom of the cave, which was the court of pan seats, there is a deep chaos with a spring as part of pagan worship to Pan, people came from all over to make sacrifices to Pan, which were then thrown down into chasm. So this, he is a god of death. So people were so frightened. Uh, there was a cave, people so very frightened. They want to find the favor of this god. So they sacrifice. And you know how, do, how they offer the sacrifice? If there is a cave, they take the sacrifice without seeing and closing their eyes and they throw the sacrifice in the cave and walk back. Such a fear they have. They were not even ready to contemplate. They were not ready, able to look into the cave. Such a fear people were having. In that place, Jesus is asking this question, who do people say that I am? So imagine, picturize with you, Jesus was taking the disciples along this temple and said, who do people say that I am? He's standing at the temple of the Caesar, the son of God, and Peter confessed and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. What I am seeing in, my, in front of my eyes, the Caesar is not the son of God, but you are the son of God. What I am seeing in front of me, he is just a mortal. He is someone who has death right next to him, the God Pan. Son of God who is supposed to provide me, protect me and take care of me, even life after death. 
he is dead over there and he that's why he is not the son of god but you are the son of god that's what peter confessed for which jesus said you are the you are the rock the peter and on this rock i will build my church and gates of hades shall not prevail against it so here when g when peter said you are the son of god not the caesar he is acknowledging the divinity of jesus christ and in fact jesus proved his sonship divine sonship through his various action how he proved his divine sonship that you can that you can find in the words of jesus and then later in his works jesus said uh, so peter said you are the christ the son of the living god for which jesus answered and said said to him blessed are you simon barjona flesh and blood did not reveal it to you but my father who is in heaven what you are seeing with eyes may not be able to reveal who i am if you see what you can, what you can see only with your eyes you will see caesar as the son of god because he was the one who is with all power the disciples were waiting for the messiah a messiah who can come and conquer the romans and take over the land and make israel great again that's what disciples were expecting but here if they see with just their physical eyes and uh, uh, fleshly thoughts jesus is not the son of god caesar will be the son of god here comes jesus peter his inner eyes were open inner heart was open to the revelation of the father where god revealed to peter and peter so peter confessed you are the christ the son of the living god caesar is not so peter shut down his physical and eyes that were of flesh and he opened his spiritual eyes and could see the reality and whatever peter has said jesus proved with his works and how he proved that he is the son of god has been explained in this verse 21 and where jesus said from from that time jesus began when peter confessed you are the christ the son of the living god which means you are the king here and you are the god here and to him he started telling from to the disciples from this point he started speaking about his death burial and resurrection imagine you are there you understood he is the son of god and immediately he started teaching i'm going to be killed i'm going to be crucified i'm going to be buried rose again i'm going to rise again from the dead he said from that time jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day how is he going to prove that he is the son of god he is going to prove through his passion death and resurrection we have meditated so much about it the entire uh, the whole month of april and even march and through his passion through his death and burial and resurrection jesus proved himself to be the case and a true son of god we can find in the scripture matthew chapter 14 verse 33 this is where uh, jesus was walking on the water we remember jesus walked on the water but we forgot what disciples understood from that do anybody know what disciples understood from jesus walking on the water the disciples and what disciples understood was in verse 33 it is not he is not ghost that is not what disciple understood this what disciple understood was in the verse 33 where it is written then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him saying truly you are the son of god jesus through his actions he proved to be the son of god not like caesar here comes see jesus who saved lives who were perishing he is not like the caesar wherever caesar goes people die you know that wherever caesar or king goes people die <laughs> because they go in war and mark chapter 15 verse 37 to 39 here we can find that jesus proved himself to the to be the son of god through his death and jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last then the veil of the temple was torn into two uh, sorry torn in two from top to bottom so when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like he, like this and breathed his last 
he said truly this man was a son of god even through his death he proved to be the son of god is there anyone who can be proved as son of god or divine by death uh, i died and said i am son of god can anybody prove that because of that very reason caesar was rejected as a son of god caesar died and people said caesar died but jesus proved himself to be the son of god even through his death just as he mentioned in matthew 16 he is going to suffer and be killed and to rise again raise again from the dead and finally we can see in romans chapter 1 verse 4 where apostle paul says and in fact he declares and he says jesus declared to be the son of god with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead through his resurrection jesus proved himself to be the son of god so now you imagine jesus as the disciples the question as he was leading them look into the heart of jesus because he knows that he is going to prove himself to be the son of god through his works death and resurrection and he has the disciples who do you think i am and peter comes and says you are the christ the son of the living god standing right in front of the caesar the false son of god that is what happened in matthew 16 i would like to show some differences between uh, the false son of gods and uh, the true son of god the false son of gods uh, sons of gods you know people were forced to accept them but here jesus proved himself and people were convinced to accept him he is not like the other sons of god all those they forced you worship me and here he rose again from the dead people bowed down before him and worshiped he, he died a centurion means an educated army officer at his death itself he is saying truly you are the son of god through his death also he commanded worship not by force by convincing the hearts of the people did you have that experience where you convinced and captured by the revelation of jesus christ in your heart which captivated you to commit yourself uh, to follow jesus as your true son of god and lord and these sons of god brought death wherever they went wherever caesar went there were wars people died wherever caesar whatever the place caesar visit you know there will be so many people slaves and army uh, and uh, you know protesters and so many people will be killed every time these people travel and the true son of god bright brought life to all wherever he went he brought life he brought life even at death not only in living places he brought life even at death so the false son of god brought they served death but the true son of god brought life for all they said fear me for i am the son of god caesar said i am the son of god so you fear me bow down and worship the caesar name i am using as a symbolic for all the false son of sons of god kindly don't think uh, i'm talking only about caesar okay <laughs> uh, because caesar was kind of uh, proclaimed as son of god after his death but the most of these caesars they uh, they uh, they said fear me because i am the son of god and here comes the true son of god who said fear not for i am the son of god people are so panicked they were scared about death and life and here comes who who says fear not and he is giving courage to people and during the times of these false sons of uh, sons of god people were more scared about life than death do you know this and here when jesus came people were set free from the fear of death and even from the fear of life he brought courage by assuring his presence to the people 
And these false sons of God, they brought fear because they are scared within themselves. People who are more scared within themselves, okay? People who ever gives more dhamkis, those are the people who are more timid within themselves. So because of fear, if I, if I give dhamki, this fellow won't come to me. Otherwise, this fellow will come. That's the reason dhamki deke unko udar se baga dete. Right? So, uh, these people, they scared people because they themselves are scared within themselves about life and death. But this true son of God, he brought life and he assured people with courage that he is with them. And all these sons of gods were defeated by death. And But this true son of God, he faced death and proved himself by defeating defeating death itself. As I told you, the pan worship, when they were, if the people made sacrifice, they don't even look at the cave. They just drop the sacrificial items there and go back. And even in Indian uh, cultures also, very many superstitions will be there. They say, oh, once you go to any death place, don't tell them you'll come back. <laughs> Such kind of things. Okay? So they don't want to look directly. They are scared. And one, you know, if any witches are there in the villages, uh, if people are passing by, they tell the children and others, don't ever look into, look at that house. If you look at that house, they will capture you and they will do something bad for you. And people are scared to look at these witchcraft and black magics. Okay? And ultimately about death. And such a fear people had. And here comes <laughs> Jesus. He is not going away from the death. But he is facing the death, you know, and he is going against the death. And he said, come over, come, we'll see. And he defeated the death. He is the true son of God. He faced the death and not just faced the death. He proved himself by defeating the death itself. And because all these false sons of God, they died and they did not raise again from the dead. And... None of these sons of God could lead us in afterlife. Pharaohs who saved their bodies, Pharaohs who saved so much of wealth, their servants, their pets, their beds, their furniture, everything in their tombs, such a huge pyramids. Could any one of them lead us in the afterlife? No, none of them. They perished there itself. Even Caesar perished there itself. And this true son of God, he alone is able to lead us even through afterlife. It is because he rose again from the dead and he is not just going to lead us in afterlife. He has shown us how, how the afterlife will be by raising again from the dead and asking us to put our, finger, our fingers in his hands. He shown how the afterlife will be. He passed through the wall and said, this is how afterlife will be. He went and baked the fish and ate and said, this is how afterlife will be. For Pharaoh, afterlife will be looking at the dust and the spider webs. For Jesus, looking at you and me is the afterlife. Eating with you and me, breakfast, lunch and dinner is the afterlife. Walking through the walls is the afterlife. This moment he is in the Galilee, the other moment he is in Jerusalem. That is the afterlife. And this is... You know, and we are not going to have those rotten bodies, but he is going to, we are going to come back with the pure, I mean, clear and completely healed flesh like Jesus. He not just, you know, he's not just going to lead us in the afterlife, but he has showed us how the afterlife would look also, already. So, when Peter confessed that you are the Christ, the son of the living God, it is saying, Jesus is the Lord of this world and of the spiritual world as well. Caesar is not the true son of God who was the ruler of this earth. But Jesus, you are the ruler of this earth. He used the interesting word. If he, Peter said only you are the son of God, we might have think that he is only some, someone related to our spirituality with God. But he used another word called Christ. You are the Christ, the living God, son of the living God. Christ is the king, the expected Messiah king of Jewish people. He is going to establish a political kingdom. That's where they were believing. 
okay so he is the one who is the true ruler of this world in physical sense as well as in the spiritual sense also he is the ruler of this world that's what it means at his name every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that jesus is the lord this is not about any just spiritual aspect where people come down and kneel and pray only it is an aspect where entire world is going to recognize him as the king amen and entire world is going to bow down before him the caesars of this world are going to bow down before him the pharaohs of this world are going to bow down before him the presidents are going to bow down before him the prime ministers are going to bow down before him everyone will be bowing down before him and accept, accepting him as the king not just some kind of spiritual only but even physically that's what peter meant when he said you are the christ the son of the living god he did he's not spiritualizing it only that's what i would like to uh, tell you the kingdom of god is going to come it is not just spiritual kingdom only it is truly going to come now we have the kingdom in our hearts we are going to experience it in its fullness in the days to come and uh, he is divinely ordained to be the lord of the world and he his every word is divinely ordained so many kings people uh, claim themselves they are divinely ordained and they slept and no help came from heaven here comes the true son of god who proved himself to be the divinely ordained and god through his resurrection he is the theocracy embodied he is the kingdom of god embodied how jesus raising again from the dead first thing he did was he broke the seal of caesar do you remember when jesus was buried uh, the uh, the sadducees went to pilate and asked him seize this stone because this fellow claimed that he is going to raise again from the dead so his disciples may bluff by stealing his body and tell everyone he rose again from the dead so put a seal so that nobody may touch so pilate put the seal of the caesar and jesus when he rose again from the dead what he did first thing he broke the seal of the caesar the tomb was open it was not closed the tomb was open that means seal is caesar seal was broken that means the power of caesar has been broken and then he rose again from the dead so when the power of caesar is broken who was declared to be the lord of the world jesus that is the reason apostle paul was teaching jesus as the lord of the world Matthew sorry Luke chapter 1 if you see see uh, Jesus during his birth it is written during the time of Caesar Augustus a census was taken census mean you know right the census was taken who were the who was the king and emperor there Caesar Augustus book of acts is a continuation of book of Luke and Luke uh, acts ends with his last chapter 26 you know how Peter, Paul was in Rome preaching Jesus as the lord in Rome Luke started saying Caesar was the lord and he closed his book saying jesus is the lord so because jesus broke the seal of the caesar so he established his kingdom here and he is god he proved himself to be god through his resurrection and he by breaking the seal of caesar he proved himself to be the lord of this world so he is god and uh, the king of this world coming together he is the theocracy the kingdom of god embodied and he is god in flesh and jesus said an amazing statement here on the rock of this confession i will build my church he said to peter on this rock i'll build my church that does not mean peter is going to be the foundation for the church peter is not the foundation the foundation for the church is the belief that jesus is the christ the son of the living god on this foundation christ built his church is there anyone here who were thinking about peter any time as you come to church no one is there anyone here who come to church thinking i'm going to worship the son of god all of us so our faith our church is founded on the belief that jesus is the son of god he rose again from the dead not on peter so on this rock i'll build my church which means on the rock of this confession Jesus is building the church and he said an amazing statement later gates of hades shall not prevail against it and again we people we tend to spiritualize everything uh, we, you know we say gates of hades means okay we are we are going to plunder the hell 
you know, we saw the picture there, uh, this picture. And this is the mod modern day picture of the temple we have seen right next to Caesar's temple. There is Pan's temple and uh, Chasm, right, this cave. And people used to throw their uh, sacrificial items in this cave, actually. Okay? So this is the cave of uh, uh, Pan. Okay? And Gates of Hades is a physical place, let me tell you. Gates of Hades is not just some kind of hell kind of thing only we imagine. But it may have some references to it, but definitely it is a physical place. So, uh, as part of pagan worship to Pan, people came from all over to make sacrifices to Pan, which were then thrown down into the chasm. This cave was known all over the region as the Gates of Hades. And now imagine, Jesus was taking the disciples and said, Gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. We spiritualize it, isn't it? Simply we spiritualize everything. So Jesus was telling the gates of Hades, which are symbolic of fear and hopelessness. God of Pan is the God of death. They are scared to go there. It's a fear, symbol of fear. Once you go there, you cannot come back. And there he is saying, gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, which means the fear or this hopelessness cannot prevail if you are standing on this rock of confession that Jesus is the true Son of God. Amen? That's what he is teaching us in those uh, incident. Death and panic always followed the false sons of God. Wherever, as I said, uh, religion and politics came together, violence took place. We Caesar, who is the symbolic for politics, and Pan, who is the symbolism for religion. When Pan and uh, religion, politics come, Death will be there. That is the symbolism here. This gates of Hades is a symbolism for death. And wherever these two come together, they bring death. And Jesus said, even death cannot prevail against you. I, I would like to hear some kind of amens when we hear these words. Death is not going to prevail against you. Not for anyone, for the church. I'm not telling this word for people around, people in the Surya enclave. Death and Hades, I mean, gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church. People who are here who are standing on the foundation of the confession that Jesus is the true Son of God. Because Jesus, uh, because of Jesus' resurrection, we don't need to fear death or hell because he has raised from the dead. He also raised us. I purposefully use the word in past tense. When Jesus rose again from the dead, we all rose again from the dead. It's a sermon for another day. If you want, it's in our uh, archive. You can go and check. Okay, when Jesus rose again from the dead, you and I, we all have raised, rose again from the dead. And we are going to experience the fullness of the resurrected life in the days to come. And we, are, we experience the resurrected life when we worship. And when we confess and stand and speak on the confession that Jesus is the Son of God, that's what Jesus said. Death and uh, gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The moment you start worshipping here, the gates of Hades, the fear of death will be removed from this place. The moment you started worshipping here, hell will be shaken. Amen? So, for the ch solution for the death, what he chose is not some kind of politics. Jesus chose the church. Okay. The solution for Hades is not a political government, not an army, but the church. You are the solution for the death in this world. And death is not going to prevail against you. Let me repeat this word. You are the solution for death in this world. Not anything else. And even hell cannot stand against you. The reason I'm, I would like to reiterate this, we Christians, we have been so passive. We forgot the power of resurrection that Christ has granted to us. When the church loses its power, what happens? Just like the salt that loses its saltiness. The saltiness of the salt is in the very nature of the salt. Similarly, our power, our strength is in the very confession 
that Jesus rose again from the dead and he is the son of God. And why are we not able to relate to it and connect to it? We are the risen uh, church of Christ and we are the solution for death in this world. That's what God chosen us to be. Gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church. And that is the reason church always ridiculed the death. Do you know this? Church always ridiculed the death. And um, that's why we, we call, in all funerals, we consider death as an achievement. I fought my race and I have a crown waiting for me. That is a victory. That's how we look at. And Apostle Paul, he's really very, uh, uh, what we call it, hilarious and very good. So he he's also ridiculing the death through 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Two times he said, oh death, where is your sting? And he said another word, oh Hades, where is your victory? Are these not the two words from Matthew 16? <laughs> Church is the solution for the death. And Hades cannot stand against it. That's why Paul also is ridiculing not just death. He's ridiculing Hades also. <laughs> death, where is your victory? Hades, where is your victory? Everything you have lost because Jesus rose again from the dead. And in him you and I are rose again. Because of the true son of God who raised from the dead, he leads us into resurrection and life after that. He has shown how does a resurrected life would look like, how afterlife looks like. Maybe I'm, I'm imagining I would, I'd love to do that. I may be walking through these walls and I'll be walking through the trees and jumping uh, in sky. I, I, it, it would be much more and better than that, I know for sure. And we'll be celebrating with God, I know for sure. And I don't need to be worried about uh, any of the sicknesses that we have or the leg pains and, you know, uh, going to various, pl jumping from planet to planet. I, I don't know, you can, you can think about it. You please imagine, I would like to encourage you to do that. Because that makes you excited. That makes you feel connected to what life got, that God has achieved for us. Imagine, imagine. Okay? Uh, that is not the description of heaven I'm talking about, but you imagine. God allows you to do that. And the tr because of the truth, Son of God has chosen us to be his representatives, to be the voice of hope in this, uh, voice of hope that he offers. We are the solution for death and Hades in this world. And we should be the source of hope to people. If we become so passive and lost the connection and the power of the resurrection Christ gave us, how can we be the source of hope to anyone else? Church, we need to wake up. We need to exercise the power of resurrection. If we ourselves don't experience, we cannot. We are going to explore more about it in the weeks, weeks to come. I know you would be having some question, how can we experience the power of resurrection? Now, we don't need to be afraid of the gates of Hades and offer sacrifices, but could come to the church and praise with joy because the true Son of God uh, overcame the death. So, no need to be panic. These people who were going through the pa pan's place, they were scared. So they were offering sacrifices with fear. Now we don't need to do that. We plundered that through Jesus Christ. We stand on top of it and say, uh, we can ridicule that uh, gates of Hades and hell and we can start worshiping the Lord. That's what we are doing uh, every Sunday worshiping. You know what? In the early church, they don't consider Sunday as Sunday worship. They, were called, they used to uh, call every Sunday as resurrection day. Do you know this? They considered every Sunday as resurrection day because they were connecting every Sunday to resurrection. What are we doing? Let us also focus on the resurrection of Jesus. Then only we'll be able to relate to the power of resurrection of Jesus. And I don't want to preach my next sermon here. So we should be able to relate to the resurrection of Jesus and the power of resurrection of Jesus and celebrate it. That's what we call it worship. It's not something you give to God. You realizing what he gave to you and exercising it. So in conclusion, Jesus, who proved himself to be the true Son of God through his holy, uh, through his power, death, and resurrection, has plundered the death and brought life and hope. On this confession, the church was founded and chosen to be, uh, chosen to be the representative of the kingdom of the Son of God, against which Hades also cannot stand. We are called to be the voice of hope and courage in the world because Jesus is the Lord of the world. And he is the Lord of the world to come. That is what Peter's confession mean when he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. May God bless you.